John Teagle Singh, and this is Viewpoint. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. The judge read the verdict in the state of Florida versus George Zimmerman for the shooting death of Trayvon Martin Saturday night. And it wasn't long before crowds began pouring out in cities around the country, protesting the ju jury's ruling and mourning Trayvon Martin's death. Now, Trayvon Martin, as you know, was only 17 when he was killed early last year with a can of iced tea and a bag of Skittles in his hands. And George Zimmerman, who shot Trayvon in a confrontation he put in motion, is a free man after the jury found him not guilty of second-degree murder or manslaughter. At the White House, President Obama issued a statement that reads in part, and I quote, the death of Trayvon Martin was a tragedy, not just for his family, but for any one community, not for any one community, but for America. And today, Attorney General Eric Holder added to that in a speech before a mostly African-American sorority. We are also mindful of, of the pain felt by our nation surrounding the tragic, unnecessary shooting death of Trayvon Martin. And as we first acknowledged last spring, we have opened an investigation into this matter. Now, However, Zimmerman defense attorney Don West told ABC News he didn't think that investigation will go anywhere. I don't think the federal investigation will develop into any sort of charges. They, yeah, they, they've they been at this since the beginning as well. We have received extensive information along within the discovery in our case of what the FBI has done. Absolutely nothing would suggest that this was a hate crime in any way whatsoever. And if it does go there, Zimmerman won't be able to afford those guys anymore anyway. And defense attorney Mark O'Mara suggested Zimmerman might be filing some lawsuits of his own. We had a lot of political and social pressures put on this case that normally were not and should not be put on the case. And there may be some uh, compensation for something like that. But Zimmerman's prosecutors also told ABC News they still believed in their case and clearly didn't believe Zimmerman's account that he was forced to shoot Trayvon Martin in self-defense. Nobody just gets a gun out and shoots. Even trained police officers, when they're on the ground with a suspect on top of them, they can't get their guns out that quickly. I think there was a struggle. At some point, Trayvon became aware of the gun and was backing up, and George Zimmerman shot him. Now, as for Trayvon Martin's parents, their attorneys say they are grieving for their son again and will not allow the weekend's verdict to define their son's legacy. For more on the George Zimmerman trial and verdict, I'm very pleased to be joined by Kenneth Nunn, a law professor at the University of Florida, Gainesville, and the associate director of the school's Center on Children and Families. Professor Nunn, what a pleasure to have you tonight on Viewpoint. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, sir. Let me ask the most obvious question. Were you surprised at this verdict on Saturday? Well, no, John, I wasn't surprised because these are very difficult cases. You could look at this case as being essentially the same as a police brutality case uh, where the police shot an unarmed black uh, young male. Uh, and jurors tend to sympathize with the police and really almost everything in this case uh, sort of tracked that, uh, that, uh, that path. So it was a difficult case for the prosecution to win. And so I wasn't surprised with the outcome. I did think, however, the prosecution could have uh, uh, presented their case in a more compelling way, and maybe that might have made a difference. Sir, in lieu of Mr. Zimmerman's background, his own history of domestic violence and assault record, uh, and uh, some of the comments he made on the 911 tape as well, and his choice to ignore the 911 dispatcher, do you think there was sufficient evidence for a jury to convict on either second degree murder or manslaughter? Oh, yeah, I think there was su sufficient evidence. I've had many cases that were uh, second degree murder cases that proceeded on uh, less substantial evidence than we had in this case. So, yes, there was sufficient evidence. And what happens is the jury has to reach a conclusion as to whose story they believe. And in this case, the jury concluded that they believed the, uh, the, the uh, defense's uh, version of, of facts, and therefore they did not come back with a conviction. Professor, what role did George Zimmerman's alleged state of mind at the time of this shooting play into the jury's final verdict? Well, we really don't know because it's not clear whether the, the uh, jury decided not to convict uh, Zimmerman because they didn't believe there was sufficient evidence of his mens rea, what we call mens rea, his mental state mm -hmm. uh, when the, the uh, pr uh, charges were brought. Was it second degree murder? Uh, was it 
uh, the recklessness or culpable negligence that we need for manslaughter or was it the, the extreme recklessness that we need for second degree murder? We don't know that. Or did they think that there was evidence of the uh, homicide but that they believe George Zimmerman's statement that he was uh, in um, uh, a fear of death or serious bodily harm and therefore decided to go with the uh, self-defense charge. So at this point, we really don't know, but really I guess the answer is that in either case, the uh, mindset of George Zimmerman makes a difference and we're not gonna know what that mindset is uh, other than by looking at the circumstantial evidence. But do you think, sir, the prosecution made a mistake in waiting until near the end of the trial to charge Zimmerman with manslaughter? Well, no, I don't, because basically this is Florida, and the way it works in Florida is that these lesser included are automatically included in the charges that uh, are brought uh, in, in a criminal case. So all that had to happen was the prosecution had to ask for uh, the manslaughter charge, and everybody in the courtroom knew that they were going to get it. So there's no surprise in that whatsoever. Now, it could be a surprise to the jury because they might not have heard any discussion of that, but that's why it was important for the prosecution to walk the jury through all of the elements for each of the charges and say, this is what we need to prove, this is how we proved it, and so we expect you to return a verdict of guilty in the case because of that. They didn't do that in this case, and I think that's probably the, the biggest factor that led to the guilty verdict. Do you think, sir, the police investigation helped or hampered this case, especially regarding the waiting six weeks to even arrest the suspect? Well, it couldn't help in any way to wait six weeks because, you know, uh, you, you, if, you're, if you're not proceeding with an investigation, then memories get old, witnesses get stale, evidence gets stale, evidence gets lost. There's a lot of bad things that can happen in six weeks, so it didn't help to wait for six weeks to begin the investigation at all. Well, when this case was first announced, as you know, a lot of folks thought it was really going to put Florida's stand-your-ground law on trial. Then, of course, famously, they weren't going to use a stand-your-ground defense, but it did seem that the judge pretty much built stand-your-ground into her instructions to the jury. So do you think that law, sir, ultimately played a role in this case? Well, yeah, she did uh, instruct the jury on stand-your-ground, but you know she didn't give the entire instruction because there's a, uh, a law in the state of Florida, an element of that law that says that you can't claim stand your ground if you are the initial aggressor. And that was not, uh, that instruction was not given to the jury. And that's another fault that I would give the prosecution. They should have insisted on them being told that because that would certainly neutralize the, the, uh, the, 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 the instruction on stand your ground if the jurors were aware of the fact that, you know, if we find George Zimmerman to have started this whole thing, he would, he would have to uh, retreat before he could use deadly force. University of Florida law professor Kevin, Kenneth Nunn. Sir, thank you so much for joining us tonight on Viewpoint. My pleasure. Thanks, John. Thank you, sir. Now, for more on this story, I am very pleased to welcome Rashad Robinson, Executive Director for Color of Change, an African-American political organization. It's a real joy to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And I'm sorry it's under such sad circumstances. I have to begin by saying the same question I asked the professor. Were you surprised by the verdict on Saturday? Unfortunately, after watching the case and, and watching it play out both in the courtroom and the media, no, we weren't surprised. Did, it, you, did you think that the state of Florida did everything they could in their prosecution of this case? Absolutely not. Um, we felt like both the, the state of Florida and what happened in Sanford during the, the lead up to arresting George Zimmerman all left plenty of holes um, and it was not the best effort the state could have put forward. So let me ask then, what does a verdict like this say to young African Americans in this country? I think it, it underscores what many folks already know. It's that they're living in a very different world. It's, it's a conversation that parents are oftentimes having with their kids that will now just be heightened by this moment um, that for many will animate a moment in their life, part of their generational story of, of when they sort of recognize that even in a world where we have a black president and folks can stand around saying, yes, we can, that we have these moments that, that prove that this country still has a long way to go for true equality and inclusion. It seems that you're very hopeful. Do you think good 
can ever come from this kind of tragedy? You know, at Color of Change, we work to transfer moments into movements. And we believe that, well, we have to believe, right, that we could take the energy of everyday people and mobilize. And, and we've seen folks of, of all races turning out in cities all around the country. We've seen folks using social media to stand up. But at the end of the day, we really need to take this energy and transfer it into real policy change um, at the state level, going after stand your ground laws and building the energy for that. And also the long-term work we need to do to hold Hollywood and our mainstream media accountable for the type of depictions and images that come into our homes every single day that really sort of underscore why a George Zimmerman would see Trayvon Martin the way he did. Okay, but by that, by Hollywood, are you talking about images of violence or how black men are portrayed? How black men are portrayed um, and, and images of violence. But if you look at the sort of the preponderance of, of the images from reality programming to crime procedures that take place out of the top 100 television shows on, on television, um, over 20 of them are crime procedures. Every single day, Americans are coming home and seeing this hero law enforcement figure who may sometimes step outside of the, the kind of um, order that he's supposed to or exactly. she's supposed to, but they get their criminal at the end and we're supposed to root for them. No, it's Clint um, Eastwood's fault. <laughs> well, yes, I think, and, and it's, well, it's, and it's also the fault of, of, um, of, of a the larger community, not, not just looking at policy, right? We have a, we have work to do to shape, to shape the way the policy works, but we've got a long road on culture too, and, and mainstream media and Hollywood is also an area we need to concentrate on. Um, what's your reaction to all the nationwide protests we're seeing now uh, around the country just spring up and as you mentioned very very racially mixed you know I, um, our reaction is this is great and what we've been working to do is trying to make sure that we we get technology out to the organizers and we support them any way they can so that we capture people's names that we're able to register people to vote that we're able to do the other sort of organizing pieces so we can transfer this energy we're we're proud that what's happened for the most part has been peaceful and an example an ongoing example of the history that black folks have had in this country of mobilizing and using civil disobedience to to make real change in this country which has been a road map for other communities as well. On your, on your website today, you are calling for Trayvon supporters to turn frustration, as you said, into action and to really go positive on this, which I admire a lot. I'm personally really sick of hearing so-called liberals yelling no justice, no peace, um, and to build a movement to hold the criminal justice system itself accountable. So that sounds great. What needs to be done? How is that practical? I think there's a wide range of things right on the table that we should be working at, from a, a national racial profiling act and leveraging the energy to the upcoming midterm elections and holding um, elected leaders accountable, to the work that we can do to push back against privatized prisons and prison industrial complex, to here in New York, to ensuring that you know we past this last hurdle in ending stop and frisk. There's so much work we can do sort of just from a policy perspective in taking the, in leveraging the energy of folks who want to get involved, who are outraged, many of whom this is a defining moment in their generation in terms of what they will remember, where they were at when their verdict was heard. And now we want to transfer that energy using technology, using all the things at our disposal to really make long-term change. I'm a fan of anyone looking for nonviolent solutions to problems like this. Really quick before we go, in the past 48 hours, you've heard the old refrain, we need to have a nationwide dialogue on race. With respect to the verdict, it's fair to say Mr. Zimmerman profiled Trayvon Martin, and in death he's been profiled by a bunch of people who've decided he's a thug. Mm -hmm. And thug seems to be the new acceptable slur in this case. How do you begin a national dialogue on race when you're up against a wall like that? You know, I, I, we believe in action and color of change, right? During the Trayvon Martin, um, during the trial, right before the trial, when the, all the lead up, you know, we led a movement to get 52 corporations to lead the American Legislative Exchange Council, the organization behind mm -hmm. the Stand, Stand Your Ground laws. And we led that by leveraging the voices of black folks and telling corporations they couldn't have it both ways. They couldn't have a relationship with black folks by day and a relationship with Alec by night. And we built power. And I think that's how you start having dialogue around race, that you build power, you organize, you raise people's voices, and you create narratives that people 
background around stories. I'm hoping that we'll see a lot from Trayvon's parents over the next couple of years through their foundation, telling their story, connecting with parents, and the work of organizations like mine and building power for everyday people on the ground. Rashad Robinson is Executive Director for Color of Change. Many thanks for some of your time tonight. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir. Okay, we're going to have much more on the George Zimmerman verdict and its impact on race relations in this country. And we're going to be asking some questions you might not hear asked too much on those other news networks. But up next, the one and only Bill Press is here to talk Harry Reid's filibuster follies, and that's a lot funnier than it sounds. Stick around.